ADHD Rewired, episode 442. This is the podcast for those of us with really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. I'm Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker by training and a coach by design. I'm your host and I have ADHD. ADHD Rewired is a more than just a podcast. We are a community. We are wired for connection and you are not alone. Go to ADHDrewired.com to learn how you can join us in our free and secret Facebook group. Get additional resources for every episode, including links to any resources we mentioned on today's show. You can support us on Patreon, sign up for our email newsletter. You can request podcast postcards to distribute to your clients and support groups. Learn all about our award-winning coaching and accountability groups. You can co-work with us in our adult study hall virtual membership community. You can do all of these things by going to our website at ADHDrewired.com. We know that starting is the hardest part, so let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. Today's a guest is Mary Kima Dolson. Mary is a clinical social worker providing psychotherapy in incarcerated populations since 2019. She is the founder of the pandemic support group SWCSO, which stands for Stuff We Can't Say Out Loud. I love that, by the way. And (laughs) the executive director for Fund That Bitch, a nonprofit group dedicated to helping women with emergency funding. That might have been the coolest intro bio that that I've ever like. That's great. I love it. I love it. I love it. I've been busy. I've been really busy. All yeah. right. So uh, you let's, let's just jump right in here. You, yeah. So you, you do a lot of work in, in the prisons and you've been doing a lot of sort of work and exploration around trauma and also attachment. So I wanted to have a conversation with you today about trauma and ADHD. And I know that there are some thoughts and ideas that you have about this, including you think that just the term trauma is overused. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought about that a lot, actually, because when we first spoke, you asked me, you said, do you think people overuse the word trauma? And I said, yep, I do. And then I thought about it for a month. (laughs) And I realized it's overused and it's underused and um, misunderstood, I think. It's overused, you know, if you if you head into work and someone says, I had a traumatic morning, or if you listen to a group of people and they're like, oh my gosh, you're so traumatizing me right now. Those have become really commonplace. And I think even believing that you've been experiencing trauma in your daily life is become kind of a concept that, you know, via TikTok and different ways, people are like, oh my gosh, yes, that's trauma. So I think it's interesting and important to really cover what trauma is and the multifaceted layers of trauma. So what is trauma? It's a physical response to a bad thing. And it's not just like I had a bad thing tomorrow. I have a a physical response, right? That is like acute stress disorder. That is, you know, something horrible happened and I had this physical reaction and and then the physical reaction lessened over time. Trauma is when it is consistent and you are starting to avoid things in your life. You're starting to avoid people in your life because it brings up this trauma. What about you? What's, what's your thoughts on the uh, on trigger warnings? Mm, that's a great question. I mean, I appreciate a trigger warning. Uh, generally speaking, I won't read it if there's a trigger warning. <laughs> okay. I'll be like, okay, that's good. I don't, I don't need to know. Um, I do think that I don't. Hmm. Well, what's your response on trigger warnings? Um, I, I, I guess part of it is the context sort of matters. Mm-hmm. Like if you're in a discussion where you're talking about, I don't know, say, uh, um, sexual health. Yeah. And in that context, there is something that uh, maybe describes a, um, you know, assault or something that I can understand. Um, I think the, this idea that we are bubble wrapping society by everything, like is a trigger warning to me, if, if you're triggered by everything, you need to go to therapy, work yeah. on it. Right. So like, it's it's not right. it's not everyone else's responsibility to like walk on eggshells because you've experienced shit like it. And yeah, mm. if, you've, if you've experienced shit like that sucks. And I'm sorry that 
whatever you've gone through, you've went through, but it is your responsibility to work through it so you can be a, you know, engaged member of society and not feel you have to put on armor all the time because you're afraid of getting triggered. Yeah. Yeah. No, that is very true. And generally speaking, something that you read, you have control over that. Something that you watch, you have control over that. So if you are having a day where you might be triggered by something, whether it's because of an anniversary or maybe it's because breakfast was off this morning. I mean, really, like it happens for whatever reason. That's something that you you can walk away from, right? So it's not really... If you're getting triggered by something you're reading, that is your job. It's your job to not be online, you know, not to walk into the forest if you're not ready for the forest. Um, You know, it's interesting, though, what you said, that people that have experienced trauma, they do need to talk about it. And this has kind of been this has been the thing that I have really been, I would say, dwelling on slightly, like, you know, like thinking about this month a lot, because there's there's so many different ways to treat trauma. There's so many different like approaches, you know, but just being able to have a safe place to say it out loud is very, very significant. And, you know, like the the group I run, which was created spontaneously during the pandemic, it's exactly that. You know, I had uh, four really good friends in my area. And when we hit quarantine, we couldn't get together and we couldn't talk about stuff that's hard. And I think we all have those really good friends in our lives that we just kind of, you know, like, and they don't need a trigger warning from us and we don't need a trigger warning from them. And we had this very weird Zoom (laughs) and we like just sat and stared at each other. And we were like, uh, because, you know, like my kid was sliding notes under the door, like people were pacing around. And I was like, I can't say my hard stuff. Mm -hmm. So I started this group online that was private And I didn't know that people could get invited. So it grew. I think it was at 800 people within a month. Mm. And then it just kept going. Mm. So this uh, stuff we can't say out loud, is that that the group you're referring to? Yes. Okay. You know, when we think about um, this sort of the, the, even just the word trauma is is, is being used uh, way more often. But I also think that we're having a much greater understanding of what trauma is. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think that in the ADHD community, I think that there is so much uh, that, that complex PTSD or CPTSD is so pervasive. Yeah. And, you know, this doesn't mean you've, you've experienced a, uh, you know, a, a traumatic event it's more of the trauma by a thousand paper cuts or the, the repeated negative feedback and failures and, and I think it's really significant. And I think that is important oh, yes. to talk about. Yes. I, um, you know, what kind of led me down this path professionally was that I, I work in addictions as well as psychotherapy and my supervision, she will always say, and she's pretty old school and delightful and I love her, but she will always say, well, you have to figure out what their trauma is. Why are they using heroin? Why are they addicted to methamphetamines? What's their trauma? She's like, what's the bad thing? And I'm like, you know, the more you dig, the more you discuss things with individuals who have gone through just like a decade, two decades, three decades of generational trauma, individual trauma. You can't quite figure out why, why they started using heroin. You can't quite pin it to one massive chronic or complex PTSD. Like it's, it's not there. They had a great family. They grew up in a wonderful household. And somewhere along the way, isn't that that traumatizing to grow up in a wonderful household? And (laughs) quite, (laughs) quite. I think that that is exactly what you said. So many of my clients also have ADHD, and I I would say that right now, at least eighty percent of my group coming out of the prison system has ADHD, and that's the trauma because they've gone through through childhood through elementary school and always been told, why can't you do it this way? Why can't you just try a little bit harder? Why aren't you doing this the way everyone else is? You know, and I thought about it right after we talked and I realized that I actually have a unique trauma response to parent-teacher conferences. Hmm. Like I, I'm like reading all about trauma and I'm like, oh no, because I get irritable. I get angry. I start pushing out. I get spiky because I have two neurodivergent kids and those parent teacher conferences, I just see how the teacher's not seeing them. No, I can I can relate to that. You know, and there's that feeling like a teacher isn't quite getting your kid. For me, it's like daddy bear comes out and it's just like oh, it's- <laughs> 
I remember yeah. when my son was, was younger, I brought with an advocate to one of our IEP meetings only because like I knew that like, I have a feeling that this isn't going to go the way I'm wanting it to. And, and, it, and I used to be hired to come, you know, with, with families. Yeah. And it's like, when it's your own kid, the gloves are off and it's like, you, you, yeah. do, you do what you got to do for your own kid, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there is at least one psychiatric prescriber out in the world today that does not want to look up my face ever again <laughs> after a meeting we had last week. <laughs> so <sighs> so there, there's some, some trauma in, in that. Um, <laughs> Now, one of the things that, that you had, had said to me when we were first talking uh, a couple of weeks ago, I think your your phrase was the trifecta of trauma. Yeah. yeah. What is the yeah. trifecta of trauma? What is the trifecta of trauma? Uh, that is the the neurology, the systemic situation that you find yourself in, and then the the final piece is is whatever is the pivot. What is that one thing that got shook the wrong way? You know, so almost sliding door event. Like um, you're 12, you you have the neurology, you have have a, an event in your life and maybe parents get divorced or something goes in a way that, that you no longer have that foundation. And then suddenly you're in the trifecta. For a lot of people right now, we're diagnosing ADHD at this extraordinary rate because the pandemic has been that situation. You know, they, they mm. lost that one validating piece. Mm. My brain just had six thoughts at the same time. And then <laughs> one of them was that I just said I was going to take a quick break. So uh, we're going to do that. And, uh, and when we come back, I want to sort of explore more about this idea of trauma because I think this is a conversation that I've been wanting to have a lot more on this podcast because I think that we just need to be having this conversation more. So Agreed. we will be right back. Support for ADHD Rewired comes from ADHD Rewired's award-winning coaching and accountability groups. You can learn more at coachingrewired.com. Registration for our fall season of coaching and accountability groups is still open. If you want to learn how to become time-wise, have your calendar reflect what really matters to you, get started on a project you've had every good intention on launching, but don't know where to start, all while learning beside other adults with ADHD who just get it, then this is the coaching community you've been looking for. Yes, living with ADHD has its challenges, but we don't have to face those challenges alone. Registration for our fall season is happening now, so don't delay. To join our fall season of coaching and accountability groups, go now to coachingrewired.com. Next week is your last chance to take advantage of our early bird registration pricing. You can still save $100 on select groups when you join us on August 18th. The deadline to submit all pre-registration submissions is 11.59 p.m. the day before our registration events. So go to coachingrewired.com to get started with your pre-registration process. And if you are listening to this after those dates, still check the website to see where we're at to find out how you can register. ADHD management is about more than just the tools. Here at ADHD Rewired, we believe in growth through community because despite our challenges and despite our setbacks, our members prove to us time and time again that we are not alone and we don't have to do the hard things in the hardest way possible. Take that first step by going to coachingrewired.com to add your name to our fall interest list. Come grow with us. Take that first step by going to coaching rewired.com that's coaching rewired.com Support for ADHD Rewired comes from Adult Study Hall, our virtual co-working and body doubling community at adultstudyhall.com. And it's the only place on the internet where you could join me on Thursday, August 18th at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern for a two-hour Homodero dance party. Let's work together for two 50-minute work blocks. And after each work block, I'll be your 10-minute dance party break DJ. Join me and a whole community of other adults with ADHD who are right now taking advantage of real-time accountability to get their toughest to-dos crossed off their list. Access to Adult Study Hall is only $19.99 a month and it is free for the first week. 
work with us in our 24 seven drop in room. Or if you would like a little extra support and structure, check out our Ash Plus offerings. Ash Plus is a Delft study hall plus facilitation. Your membership includes access to both our Ash 24 seven room and our Ash Plus sessions. There are sessions for writing, finances, creative work, your most dreaded tasks, anything job searching career related, and there are weekly accountability check-ins. Whether our 24 seven drop in room is more your thing, where you can work at your own pace, but don't have to work alone or connecting with others and getting a little extra guidance is more for you. There is an adult study hall session for you. Whether you're doing work or doing dishes, come work with us. This is the virtual co-working and body doubling community where people with ADHD are getting things done while having a little bit of fun. If you haven't given it a chance, try it out this week. Adult Study Hall is free for the first week and it's only $19.99 a month after that. Come work with us. That's adultstudyhall.com. One more time, adultstudyhall.com. All right, we are back with Mary Kima Dolson. We were just talking about the trifecta of trauma, talking about neurology, uh, the systemic barriers, and then yes. an event. Yes. But as we were saying too, that, that it seems like a lot of the trauma in the ADHD community is not the event, but it's more of life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How does someone recognize if what they are experiencing is not just ADHD, but that if that it is trauma is actually a, a part of this picture? That's a great question. You know, something that I see a lot in my work is people diagnosed with PTSD, which is is almost always complex PTSD. Um, can, I have can you defined fact- the differences between those two. Sure, absolutely. So PTSD, uh, civilian PTSD, is is one or a handful of events in your life at a certain time that have created a physical response. So the physical response that I see most often is an individual has an event, they can't sleep at night, they wake up feeling like they've run a marathon and essentially their brain is in a thought trap all night long trying to solve this problem, right? They avoid certain things during the day, they're irritable, they're they're lashing out and they never feel safe. They just don't feel safe in their present, but that's usually one event or, or a handful of events. And then we have complex PTSD. And I think the best way I can describe complex PTSD is kind of that fire wire situation in in the brain. You have zero to two, which is one of our most important developmental stages. Um, Our brain is growing and changing at a rapid rate. So if a child at this time from in utero to two is experiencing neglect, is experiencing, uh, the mom is experiencing some sort of violence, uh, something is happening in the home, there's more cortisol racing through the body, that child ends up with attachment issues. Uh, now, this is all repairable, right? So I, I have seen kids who have had like zero to two be very traumatic. They reunite with family members after that. They have a perfectly wonderful childhood and maybe they have some stuff from that. Maybe they grow and learn, but they, they deal with what happened to them between zero and two, but they do not have complex trauma. What essentially happens with complex trauma, and let me know if I'm talking too fast. <laughs> this is a big one. <laughs> is that the same thing happens when they have that next speedy developmental course in their brain. And that tends to be around adolescence. They're going not as fast as zero to do, but they're going extraordinarily fast. So if you have a child in their adolescence and they continue to be experiencing that neglect, they continue to be experiencing sexual violence, uh, emotional violence, then you start seeing an adult that has essentially a neurology that looks on the surface level to be a lot like ADHD. And that is complex trauma to me. Mm -hmm. So what do we do about it? Well, that's the magic question, isn't it? Um, What I tend to tell people that I work with is that a lot of the behavioral tools that we have for ADHD, the the timers, the, the awareness around what's happening, that works the same way. Right. The medication tends to be different, but the management of the racing thoughts tends to be about the same. What I'm starting to notice and what I question in my work and talk about at work a lot is what happens when it's both. Right. So what happens when we have a child who their neurology is ADHD and they're experiencing trauma, then they hit adolescence. They still have ADHD. 
they are experiencing that trauma. And this is where I find a lot of my clients are, is in that. Uh, that's the grand trifecta. <laughs> so what, what would you say are some of the maybe less obvious sort of um, uh, markers behaviorally and emotionally of, of trauma? Because I think that, that there are definitely people who have experienced a lot of really tough stuff but may not be like identifying uh, with yeah. with trauma. And, you know, I, th- I think one of the things that I've always uh, found an important thing to share is that like trauma is not about what it was that happened. It's about how you in- have internalized and like what the story was that you, yeah. you know, from your, from your perspective. So it's sort of say someone else to someone that, well, that's not that big of a deal. Like, well, you weren't in their shoes. Absolutely. Yeah. W- one thing that is, is usually a red flag for me is that they don't connect with it. You know, and and mm-hmm. something that I, you know, my daughter's in her teens and sometimes her friends are over and they're like, oh my God, I'm so traumatized. And of course my daughter's like, yay, it's so fun to live with a therapist. Cause I'll come in and be like, so here's the fun thing about trauma. I'm like, when you're experiencing or have experienced trauma, you don't talk about it. You don't bring it up. You You have a fortress around you. You're fine, you're good. Life is great. You're busy. You're so busy. You're mm-hmm. loving your job. You're, I think there's this, this, uh, you know, you, you protect yourself. You don't want to discuss it because every time you have, you have not been validated or believed. I'm wondering when you're saying that, I was immediately wondering what if there's a, if we know of what the correlation is between trauma and workaholism with ADHD. Mm, mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I would love to see those studies. <laughs> They're got to be out there. You know, part of my question was uh, stemmed from my own personal uh, story of like learning some of the things that were that I didn't realize were sort of trauma features uh, when I was doing some pretty intensive therapy um, a couple of years ago. And one of the, the things that um, it was kind of freeing to learn is that for me personally, when I'm triggered by something, my brain becomes quiet, like definitely Mm. quiet, where it's like, I can't, no words are coming to me. It's just crickets. Yeah. It's just one of the things that I've learned that, that when I'm in that state, it is often something is sort of trauma triggering. Yeah. Yeah. Would you say you're like, it's freeze? Like you just go into freeze? (sighs) I don't know if it's freeze. It's... It's almost the equivalent of someone put duct tape on my like brain, but like my mouth, like wow. it's like all activity seems to stop. Yeah. And it's like, I'm aware that that's happening, but then I almost get like stuck in that, like where I, I don't know how to get out of it in a sense. Yeah. Um, the one thing that I have learned that has been helpful is just keep talking, even if it's like nonsense word salad, it just like, just keep talking and it, it helps. Keep it coming. That makes sense. Yeah. But that was really, that was a really interesting uh, sort of thing that, to learn. I just thought it was like, oh, it's just like my, my brain just stressed. I was like, well, yeah. maybe. Yeah. No, I've seen that. I have seen that because sometimes, and, and I think that might be specific to ADHD, it, is that you, you know, the, the shutdown effect. Mm-hmm. And also, you know, if the, well, of course, I mean, if you have ADHD, all your trauma is connected then to ADHD and how you process information and all the different areas in your brain. You know, it's it's so interesting because I see everything in a very strengths-based perspective. I always have. And I was looking online to see if I could find any sort of study on the amazing, like, uh, spatial memory that I've seen with my ADHD clients, the amazing auditory like the the ears, the the things they're sensitive to, and everything was dysfunction. Everything was a problem. Everything was a disorder. And I'm like, well, hold on. <laughs> These are amazing things that individuals with ADHD can do. And sure, they don't have great working memory all the time. But what does working memory even, how does that benefit any of us? Well, but one way I can hold the thought in my mind to answer the question that you just asked me. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, that's, uh, it's, it's sort of our, our working memory is like our brain sort of like muscle in a sense. It's like our ability yeah. to flex and be able to use and utilize little bits of information, but then for functional use. Yes. Yes. Um, so what are some of the things that you think from a systemic perspective that mm. is needed in, in, I don't want to say like 
the world because that's a huge question. But like in the ADHD community, as well as in with people who have experienced and are experiencing trauma. Hmm, you're asking some like world changing questions. I, know. I like. I dig <laughs> it. No, I like it. Um, do you ever watch Sesame Street? Yes. Okay, it's a great show. Great show. Do you remember as a child? When Big Bird told everyone on Sesame Street about Snuffleupagus and they never believed him. Okay, so this, so I recently had this con- like conversation with somebody and I okay. didn't realize that he was actually like in Big Bird's imagination until they decided that he wasn't going to be. Like, I don't remember that part at all. Really? Yeah. So for me as a child, this was profound. Um, I, I remember feeling the injustice of Big Bird trying to say, no, like Snuffleupagus is coming and I want you to meet him. And all the adults on the street being like, OK, Big Bird, you know, whatever. And and I think essentially what happened is not only did they get letters from children, they got letters from mental health professionals saying like to not believe a child is traumatic. Mm. To not invest in what a child is saying is traumatic. So every time you're telling Big Bird that Snuffleupagus is not real, that it's in his head, you're devaluing him. And they kind of created this whole storyline of being them being wrong. And not only did they realize they were wrong, but they apologized to Big Bird. And it was it was amazing. Like Bob McGrath, who I saw once in the parade. <laughs> do you do you ever see the parade in New York City? The the Thanksgiving parade. I know of it. I've seen it passing okay. on TV. Yeah. I went to it once and just for the Sesame Street float. So that's side note. Sorry. <laughs> but he said to Big Bird, he said, From now on, we'll we'll always believe you mm. when you tell us something. But that's the systemic issue to me that our adults are still doing. It's it's Okay, so I'm having, a, I'm maybe connecting some some ideas here right now. Okay. So with my own sort of like trauma trigger type of stuff, I think part of it is, can be sort of triggered by a, when I'm feeling like what I'm trying to communicate or express is not being understood. Mm-hmm. And I I remember how awful it felt when I, as a kid, like when I was told that, that like my parents didn't believe me, mm-hmm. right? Because like when um, when I was a kid, there were certainly things where I, that I would lie about. Um, and it wasn't like I lied about that thing. It was, I was a liar. Yes. Right? Which yes. was just like, Awful. Yeah. Right? And so it's, it's interesting if that is um, just that, that, um, feeling of not being understood, um, how that, that connection to, uh, uh, to trauma. Um, Mm -hmm. yes, I'm just working on some shit personally here on the podcast. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. (laughs) Let's get in there. No, it's, it's so significant though, Eric, it's so important. And, you know, we can get into like, There's complexities in psychotherapy. There is complexities in working with someone who has a trauma background. Um, There's complexities when when you're walking in and you're supporting someone who has ADHD or you're working with them. And for the first time in 40 years, they're being told, hey, uh, what you're experiencing is is a thing. Right. You know, like these are huge events. But I think one of the most powerful things I do in that room is I just I just say, yes, that happened to you. like. I validate that that is an experience that you had. Yes, you went through school and yes, it wasn't fair. One of my favorite activities is I work with individuals who are leaving like the federal and state prison system after long term sentences. And I sit with them in a room and I'm like, prison is a broken system. What happened was not fair. It doesn't matter what you did. It's not reasonable. This is not a place where you were rehabilitated. And that starts now, you know? Mm. Well, it's, what have been some of the more significant responses that you've had to telling that to someone? Oh, I mean, tears. Yeah. <laughs> tears, uh, but also just kind of uh, like a very warm feeling, you know, because, you know, when you're, when you're talking to someone who really hasn't had nice things in 14, 15 years sometimes in in the prison system, um, just to realize they're in a safe spot and realize they're in a place where there's unconditional positive regard, right? It is, 
I think it's a very quiet feeling. You know, we don't have a parade. We don't celebrate. They still have to do a very hard life. They have to figure out how to go into this world and adjust appropriately. But I always tell them, like, my goal here in the mental health field is just to help you get through it. I'm like, you can text me. You can call me and say, oh, my parole officer is driving me crazy. And I'm like, you're allowed to say all of that to me. I'm like, I don't have to report that out. Like, <laughs> like, let's just hash it out. Let's get through this. And, and you know, and for many of my clients, our mantra is no new charges. <laughs> That's our goal. <laughs> mm. let's, uh, let's take a quick break. Uh, when we come back, I'd like to know a little bit more about you personally and how you got into this work. So... We will be right back. Support for ADHD Rewired comes from you, our listeners who tune in every week. If you enjoy this podcast and want to stay up to date with our weekly episodes, then don't forget to subscribe or follow ADHD Rewired by going to ADHDrewired.com slash podcast or just hit that subscribe or follow button in your favorite podcast player. Thank you to all of our listeners who have shown us some love by leaving us ratings and reviews on Apple Podcasts and all the other podcast apps that accept reviews. And if you haven't had a chance or even meaning to, but keep forgetting because we have ADHD, pause us now. We'll be here right after you finish leaving that review. We also have more podcasts on ADHD in the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network, and you can check them out now. Those include ADHD Essentials with Brendan Mahan, Hacking Your ADHD with Bill Curb, and ADHD Diversified with MJ Siemens. Find ADHD Rewired and all of our shows by going to ADHDrewired.com slash podcast network. Then you can join me and the rest of the ADHD Rewired podcast family and ADHD Rewired coaches for our monthly live Q&A. Go to ADHDrewired.com slash events to register and join us on Zoom every second Tuesday of the month at 10.30 a.m. Pacific, 1.30 p.m. Eastern. Find this podcast and all of our shows and get registered for our monthly live Q&A and see everything else we do by going to ADHDrewired.com. That's ADHDrewired.com. And thanks for listening. Support for ADHD Rewired comes from listeners like you who support us on Patreon. What is Patreon? It is a way for people like you to support independent content creators like me. To become a patron, go to ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. Starting at just $5 a month, you can get ad-free episodes. At $25 a month, you could join me once a month every fourth Tuesday of the month at 3 p.m. Central. When you do join at the $25 a month level, you'll also get those ad-free episodes and audio recordings for those monthly coaching calls. You do need to set up your RSS feed through Patreon. And I want to welcome and thank Justin F., Breland Y., and Kristen E. for becoming patrons this last week. Thank you so much for your support. And if you choose to pay yearly versus monthly, you could save about 8%, which comes to about one month free. If it's in the budget right now for you and you have been getting value from ADHD Rewired, please consider becoming a patron. Go over to ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. Again, that's ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. And don't forget to set up your private RSS feed. You do it through the Patreon website. You'll get a private link. You will then paste it in your favorite podcast player. It works with almost every podcast app, I think, except for Spotify. So if you've been a $5 a month patron and haven't set up your RSS feed yet, or you would love to be able to listen to these episodes without listening to these ads, go to ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. That's ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. And thanks. All right, we are back with Mary Kima Dolson. So tell us how you got into uh, specializing in, in this work because you're, you're working with some really challenging populations with, in the, the realm of, of ADHD. Yes. Um, how did I get into this work? I mean, I, I started as a teacher. So I was in education for 13 years. 
And I always like adored the most challenging child in the classroom. And the truth is, I was always the most challenging child in the classroom. Oh, yeah. Like, like when I see teachers on the street now, like I don't really want to talk to them and they don't really want to talk to me. Uh, (laughs) I'm a little proud of that fact. I don't know. (laughs) But um, but I, I started finding myself in a lot of parent meetings, like parents would call me and say, hey, you just seem to really understand my child. And and can we talk about this a little bit? And I felt like I was a little out of my wheelhouse. Like I was like, I would I love talking to parents and I love being able to tell parents, hey, this is something your kid's going to get through. And these are the things I see them do that are so amazing. But I was like, I probably need to go and, and level up. And so I went to grad school and my first internship was in outpatient services for mandated populations. Mm. And, and I when, mean, when, just, when you say man, just for, for listeners who might not know what that term means, mandated populations. Uh, mandated populations means that they are required through the court system to do mental health therapy and, and often substance use therapy along with that. And I, I loved it. It was like a a puzzle piece finally clicking. And truly, I was like, this is my crew. Mm. Like, I love these guys. And 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 you know what? They They can keep up. I bet they felt that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Because people know if you actually genuinely, like, appreciate who they are or if you're just there because this is your job. Yeah. No, they they know I love it. Um, We we run some fun groups. (laughs) So when did you learn that you had ADHD? I don't have ADHD. You don't have ADHD. I don't have ADHD. Uh, I have a daughter with ADHD. I have a spouse with ADHD. Um, I have a son with autism and I am also on the autism spectrum. Okay. So how does that play out for you? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, oh, we're a noisy family. Um, it, It is... I actually have, I feel that autism and ADHD, and I'm going to make a Sesame Street reference again, but we're the Bert and Ernie's of the world. You know, we just really, (laughs) we're so different, but we're so in love with each other's vibe. Does that make sense? Absolutely. You know, so like, like my daughter is such a Bert, just a planner, like very careful with all of her little details. My son is such an Ernie, just a bathtub toys everywhere. The room is chaos and there's art just strewn across the world. And, I, and I'm an Ernie. And, and I think Ernie's and Bert's can, you know, I think the diagnosis could be different depending on how, you know, maybe Bert, Bert sometimes has autism as well, but <laughs> maybe Ernie's got ADHD depending on, on which angle we take. But, but I am, I am an Ernie in the household. Um, I think that we, I don't worry about the same things. And I think it's nice to not worry about the same things. I think that that is a nice anchor. And, you know, I'm very big on um, my curse and my blessing is that that I'm constantly making prediction patterns. So, you know, where where my spouse is constantly overthinking the small details, I'm jumping to like, what are the next 20 years going to look like? Or what were the 20 years that we just experienced? Does that make sense? I think so. It's, it's um, chaos. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm, there, there are a lot of uh, behaviorally sort of on, from that sort of outside, a lot of similarities between autism and ADHD, but neurologically it is very different. Very different. Uh, when people ask me like what, what the big difference is, I tend to say like where my spouse is like a rabbit digging burrows and always trying out a new burrow. And so the yard, you know, is just a million different dens of interests and pockets of joy. I'm like a giant one mile down route Mm. where like my interest is all the way down. Hmm. When you say that, like, I I definitely have the preference of going deep versus wide. Um, (laughs) (laughs) So you you, you have three major interests that you, you shared with me before, yes. ADHD being one of them. Oh, yeah. You're a runner and you have yes. a lot of interest in, in that. How, how, did, how did that form? That's a great question. I, I mean, I have a dog. I, his name's Mudge and he is a St. Bernard who we got at the shelter when he was about two years old and he had never been in a house. He was completely feral. And he was intense. Mm. And I started running with him because he needed to run. And we we still, you know, five years later are doing the same route. And it's just me and Mudge every morning. But it it's good for me. It's great for him. But for me to do something so like it, I think I told you, I never changed the route. <laughs> I never changed the tunes. 
like it, it's it I always do better if I've done that run. So I have to imagine that you are dealing with a lot of unpredictable behaviors in the, with the clients that you're working with. Definitely. Yes. How does that work for you? <laughs> Am I flexible? Is that what you're asking? <laughs> are you? <laughs> Um, I'm actually very like, I think I love it. I mean, I think that I, I think there's unpredictable patterns, but there's also, there's also stuff that's very, very predictable. And actually, like when you mentioned that, that is where, when something horrible happens, right? So when that, when it's unpredictable, it's not small, it's a new crime, it's a tragedy. I've had so many of those this year and that breaks me. You know, and, and it is directly related, I think, to my own neurology, because when it's when it comes out of the blue and I can't control it, I can't stop it. And and maybe even my client relationship has ended because of what happened. I just tank. Mm. And it does take a really, really long time to get back from that. You know, with um, with the experience for a lot of people with, with autism, being that things are just experienced so intensely. And if trauma is not what happens, but how it's experienced, I have to imagine that there is probably even more trauma in the autism community than, than ADHD. And that's, I'm just speculating, but what, what's your thoughts on that? Well, and I don't know if it's, I think it's very different, um, you know, with, with ADHD, because, you know, we discussed like auditory memory, olfactory memory, spatial memory. I think those are huge triggers for somebody with ADHD. And because working memory is not, you know, on full blast, you don't always know why you're triggered, right? Mm-hmm. But it could be a sound you heard. It could be something you smelled because those memories are so profound. With autism, you know, this is definitely true for my son. It's true for me. I can't speak for the whole community. Right. I have emotional memory that does not go away. Mm-hmm. So if I have a, an event in my life that elicited emotion, I can go back to that. Like it happens, like it's happening yeah. all over again right now. All the time. So, you know, for example, two weeks ago, I got terrible news at work and it took me a really long time to process. But when I did process it, I basically went down like a, a drop of rain falls in a puddle and you get those loops out. What my brain did and what it did all day is it kept looping out to every time I'd ever felt that way before. Ooh. Yeah. That sounds intense. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It was, you know, in the, in the moment, and this is pretty classic, I think for anyone with a neurology that's not, you know, typical and I don't sure anyone has a typical neurology, but my colleagues were like, why, what's wrong with you? We're telling you something horrible. What's wrong with you? And they really, I mean, Yikes. that hurt me. Yikes. That was really bad for me because I was just, I was already, the drop was already going. I was already making these connections. Mm. And it wasn't until nine hours later when I was driving home that I had emotion about it. You know, just a good solid 45 minute drive home crying. Wow. <laughs> <It's> like, wow. <laughs> mm. And then, and then my week was messed. It was not good. It was yeah, bad. It took you a significant time to recover, huh? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And I think I'm, I'm slowly learning that. Um, and just in the world of therapy, we start recognizing, oh, this affects me too. This, this is hard. And, and I need to work out why it's hard <laughs> and, and maybe take a day. <laughs> and I imagine that the, the, how important a really robust uh, sort of self-care yeah. routine or habit, or especially with the work yeah. that you're doing, which is, uh, oh, yeah. which is amazing, by the way. Like it's, uh, it's, there are lots of people who I, I'm, I'm sure you see it, who, working in these populations who it's uh, like they're kind of hardened and like are, you know, they're just doing because that's the job they fell into 20 years ago and they're just doing it to, get, you know, get the pension. And yeah, and it's, it's sad. Yeah, yeah. It's really sad. And, I, and to hear someone like yourself who like I can tell genuinely loves it despite it sometimes being really, really, really yeah. hard. Yeah, I, I do love it. It is, it is true. I um I I got offered a job recently, you know, working with teens in and I, I I declined it. And I just finally, you know, they asked me to interview and I was like, sure, it's always important to interview and and practice interviewing. And within that interview process in my head, I was like, Mary, you would hate this job in three weeks. <laughs> like you would miss these guys so mm-hmm. much. And then, you know, they can keep up Uh, individuals who find themselves in the prison system. They are rejected by society um, for numerous different reasons, often because of neurology. And they're just the smartest, 
most interesting, um, unique individuals ever. And what happened or or what they did doesn't it, it doesn't mean they're bad people, you know, and, and I mean, talk about continuous systemic issues for individuals with ADHD, because now they have felonies, which make it hard to do anything. Yeah, yeah. it's a it's truly a broken system. But uh, I like to at least add a little bit of like <laughs> joy <laughs> and humor to it, to their daily life. So. You love learning about ADHD. You love running. Henry the tortoise. Oh, me and Tell Henry have had an Henry interesting the week. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, Henry the tortoise. I, it was like, I think seven or eight months ago, I was like, I need a tortoise. Like I would, was it I like would a go. a random thought that you needed a tortoise, but it felt like the strong conviction or was there like something that like was building about like. Uh, it was building. Okay. It was building. I was definitely reading about tortoises. I was reading about specific tortoises. I would go, I would go to the pet store to pick up my daughter's guinea pig stuff, and I would stare at the tortoise, and I would, I would text my spouse and say, "Just so you know, this is very specific, but I need a tortoise for my birthday." And then, you know, then I would be at the farm store, and I would be like, "Just so you know, this is very specific, but that's where I want him to live." <laughs> And it was, you know, like a big, uh, amazing tortoise habitat. And he he read the room and he actually, it, it was a beautiful moment because I was driving home from a pretty long and hard day at my job. And he texted me a picture of who was Henry the tortoise. And it was about a month before my birthday. And he said, Henry couldn't wait. Aww. And <laughs> I, love that. I mean, I felt such profound joy. Mm. And I think that... Henry, to me, is actually, you know, he's going to live 55 years, oh. which means that I need to live 55 years <laughs> and that I need to stay on track and I need to keep running and I need to keep doing my life. I'm in an interesting stage of, of life. You know, I'm, I'm in my 40s. My children are growing up. They don't require me like young children do. They do need me around. You know, I've not given up on the idea of parenting, but this is I'm in that stage where you start letting them go and you start letting them embrace the world and you start seeing what they're going to do and trust that I did a good job, you know, and that I that I taught them how to be, you know, thoughtful, engaging human beings. And I think for for most women and men on the planet, when we hit that stage, we're like, what do I do with my life? And I think that Henry is what I do. Mm -hmm. Oh, you, you, you are having an impact. And uh it's just thank you for for doing the work that you do. It's a, a real real asset and a, and a gift to the community. Well, thank you, thank you. So your website punkasfun.org. What what can people yes. find out there? Uh, what happens at punkasfun.org is I create uh, zines that provide ADHD skills and ADHD practice in a nutshell. I started drawing these uh, about a year and a half ago because, and this is true for, I think, the the entire ADHD community that you hand someone a book and they say, and this is true for autism as well. And you're like, yeah, I'm not into that book. <laughs> like I might, I will put my coffee on that book. I will not read that book. And I really needed some of my clients to learn those skills. I really needed my clients to start understanding their condition a little better you know, most of them were never diagnosed as kids. So I make these kind of flashy, <laughs> I mean, flashy, risque even. I mean, there's a little bit of swearing. There's a lot of anecdotal stuff by me. Um, so I'm, I'm on your website right now. And uh, so it's, it's a, from just like artistically, I find it really fascinating because on one hand, it, it like there's part of it that looks like it could have been like created in the 1990s. But like that was intentional, <laughs> right, right, but I, but you can almost tell that like there, there's this like very yeah. like I'm uh, duct tape as art kind of like, mm -hmm. and so you've mm -hmm. one of the um I see one article rejection sensitive dysphoria is not an STD, um, yeah. which I think is I love that. Um, <laughs> you have another one that says sorry I'm fucking late. Um, yeah. it, it, so it's uh it seems like it's really just it's designed to give somebody a bite. Yeah, yeah, it, it's designed to. I print them for people in the office. I want something that people can walk away with, tuck it in their back pocket if they're taking the bus and something that's just very like visceral, very like I can look at this today and I can remember that this horrible feeling I'm having has a reason. 
I love in your explanation, you say, uh, it, I'm, I'm just looking through this one thing. It says, you have a gorgeous hyper-focus, which makes it difficult to leave an activity even mm -hmm. when it's time to go. I, I love when certain words you don't normally hear in the, that kind of context. There's just something that just makes me so like joyful <laughs> about that. Like, like the word like delicious, like when yeah. it's used to describe something that's not food. Like I kind of love that. <laughs> I do think hyper focus is gorgeous. It's it's more about knowing to stop than than ever stopping the hyper focus. I don't remember if I share this on a, on a podcast or for some one of my coaching groups, but I came up with the word um, uh, instead of hyper focus. It was a uh, hyper focus, which is yeah, that's good. <laughs> which is that that moment where you're in hyper focus and you're like, fuck, I can't get out of it. Like, yeah, like, like you know, you're just like fucking yourself, and you're just like. Yep. But I'm stuck and I'm going to just keep going. And I'm going to keep pulling that thread. Yeah. <laughs> so Mary, is, uh, is that website, is that the best place that people can get a hold of you? That is the best place for people to get a hold of me. And I do, I do run um, a Facebook group called uh, Punk is Fun, the ADHD Revolution. And that is another place. I mean, it, it, we get pretty salty over there. Um, talk about all of the things that people don't often say out loud about ADHD and life in general. But um, people can find me there as well. I feel that we are, as a community, a group of people who often say the things that we're not supposed to say out loud. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which is delightful and important I love and it. good. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Mary Dawson, thank you so, so much for uh, spending the time with us, sharing uh, what you have here and for the work that you're doing. Yeah. Thank you very much for having me. It was a delight. Thanks so much. This is Eric Tivers. Thank you for listening and congratulations for making it to the end. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. The website is ADHDrewired.com. You can find timestamped summaries and additional resources for each episode. Apply to join our free and secret Facebook community. Learn more about our award-winning intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups. Join the Adult Study Hall virtual co-working membership community. Find all the other podcasts on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. Sign up for my email newsletter to get exclusive content that you won't hear anywhere else. And use the search tool to find episodes on specific topics. You can do all of this at ADHDrewired.com. While you're there, click on the Patreon button. If you are a regular listener, consider making a monthly contribution by becoming a patron. If you are able to financially support my work, it would mean a lot. This show is free to you, the listener, but it's not free to produce. Plus, patrons get cool perks like ad-free episodes and access to recordings of coaching calls and $25 a month patrons and join me once a month for a group coaching call. You can follow me on Twitter at Eric Tibbers. You can like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash ADHD Rewired. If you're a coach, therapist, or related professional, connect with me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash Eric Tibbers. Subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube to see selective interviews and other videos I've made. Podcasts change lives. You can make a difference in someone's life by spreading the word about this podcast. Mention it in your online communities on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, or wherever you hang out online. And be sure to share it with your friends, family, your therapists, your coaches, doctors, siblings, parents. And if you, your coach, therapist, doctor, or ADHD support group leader would like a pack of podcast postcards to hand out, you can request those at the website, ADHDrewired.com. If you are a member of Chad, Ada, or any other ADHD support group, please be sure to tell them about this show and all the shows on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. You can even show them how to download it on their phone. And if you really loved this particular episode, please hit share on your podcast player. I'm only one person, and I do count on you to help spread this message. One of the biggest things that you can do to support this podcast and help other people discover it is to leave an honest rating and review on Apple Podcasts or any other app that supports reviews. And don't forget to hit subscribe so new episodes are automatically pushed to your favorite podcast app. Looking for more ways to listen and learn? Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at Audible by going to audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Here is my list of must-listen-to audiobooks updated July 2021. Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg, attached by Amir Levin and Rachel Heller. 
Atomic Habits by James Clear, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lencioni, Crucial Conversations by Carrie Patterson, The Coaching Habit by Michael Stainer, The Body Keep Score by Bessel van der Kolk, Rest by Alex Sujong Kim Pang, The Five Second Rule by Mel Robbins, Make It Stick, The Science of Successful Learning by Peter Brown, The Productivity Project by Chris Bailey, Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics by Dan Harris, Change Your Questions, Change Your Life by Marilee G. Adams. I always recommend to my coaches and admin that they read that book. The One Thing by Gary Keller, a required reading for all of our coaching group members. Procrastinate on Purpose by Rory Baden. The Four Tendencies by Gretchen Rubin. The Art of Asking by Amanda Palmer. And if you're looking for something a little bit more magical, I have fallen in love with the Harry Potter series and the narrator, Jim Dale, is amazing. And of course, if you haven't yet boarded the Brene Brown bus, all of her stuff is great. Starting with Gifts of Imperfection, Daring Greatly, Rising Strong, and The Power of Vulnerability. And if you're an entrepreneur or leader, be sure to check out her book, Dare to Lead. Do you have something that you would like to share? Click on the podcast tab at ADHD Rewired. Click the button to be a guest at the top of the page and schedule a 15-minute interview. This is Eric Tibbers reminding you to keep learning, growing, and connecting. Self-care is not selfish. No matter what you get done or don't get done, you are still enough. And no matter how hard it feels, we can do hard things. And we don't need to do them in the hardest way possible. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next week.